Sisters and brothers, let's close our eyes and offer our prayers. This past week has been a difficult week to go through. We first will spend some time to pray for the nation and then we offer our prayers for other things. I'll read from Psalm 2. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your throne with much trembling because we know that you are the sovereign God of the universe. In you is the power to establish and to destroy. Oh, Father, we come to your throne. We praise your holy name because you are compassionate and merciful God, slow to anger, but abounding in love and faithfulness. Oh, Father, we thank you for saving us out of death and deliver us into life. We thank you for saving us in your son, Christ Jesus. Now we have the Holy Spirit that is your spirit indwell in our hearts. Make us the likeness of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. And all those things are beyond our fathom, but we accept it with faith. Now we offer our prayers for this country and we, we thank you for this country. We thank you for the many faithful brothers and sisters and the leaders in this country. We thank you that uh, a peaceful transition is in sight. We thank you that you still have kept a group of faithful brothers and sisters who lift up their prayers for this country. And we continue to cry out to you for your protection over the people in this country. And Lord, have mercy on us. When we seek your face, Lord, spread your wings over us, protect the people in this country, turn our hearts back to you, Lord. As we do, shine your face upon us and give us peace. Lord, we pray for the president-elect, Joe Biden, give him a heart to fear you and to govern with wisdom from above. Lord, we pray for the outgoing president, give a heart, him a hard heart to uh, fear you and to have a heart to care for the people. Yes, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for ability to come to your throne, to pray for those who are in authority, because uh, even those rulers, Lord, are under your sovereignty. And we pray that you turn their hearts toward you. Well, Father, now we pray for this congregation. We pray that you, in this new year, give us your word, and your spirit to make us stronger by your word, by your spirit. 
anchor our faith in Christ and live every day with faith. And Lord, we pray for the students, middle school, high school, and college students. This is not easy time for students. We pray for your strength and the hope in Christ and the hope and the joy and you can give us through your spirit to sustain us through this period of difficulty. When we are isolated from our friends, from our schools, and Lord, we ask you for your help. When we gather, Lord, um, in church groups, and Lord, you help us to really anchor our faith in you and walk through every day with joy and hope. And Lord, we also pray for those who are struggling physically, spiritually, emotionally. And Lord, give us, uh, deliver us from the trouble and show us the way out. And Lord, we need you and heal us for those who need healing and strengthen us for those who are weak and comfort us when we are hurting. We look up to you, Lord, uh, for strength. Now, as we continue to worship in your word, we commit your servant Fawn to your throne. Give him your spirit, double portion of your spirit. Give him your word to preach because we need your word. Your word is more important than our life. Oh, Father, may your throne be established among us. May your glory be seen in this place. Because you deserve all the glory in this uh, year of 2021. Even though our environment is still unpredictable, but the Lord, you are trustworthy. Thank you, Lord, for being a faithful God. In Jesus' name, we thank you and pray to you. Amen. All right. Thank you, Elder Jeff. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is Sunday again, and it is great. A pleasure to be here online with all of you. Now, as, as Elder Jeff briefly mentioned earlier, that uh, starting this year, we want to, or at least this first quarter, we want to go through the Book of Numbers. And before I get into it, I just want to talk a little bit about it as to the reason why. And the biggest reason is there's a lot in Old Testament that uh, a lot of us can still learn today, that we know that the whole Bible, not just the New Testament, but the whole Bible is very important. And that for all the aspects of the Bible that we are weaker in, we want to uh, continue to strengthen ourselves in that. And we believe that is a good place to start is the book of Numbers. But on top of that, there's a lot of events and stories that happen in the book of Numbers that truly also have that parallel for many of our lives today. Now, believe it or not, even though ancient Israel lived thousands of years ago, many of us today, the church, you and myself, we're still very similar to ancient Israel. We have similar struggles, similar doubts and questions and temptations. And so brothers and sisters, as we begin our journey into the book of Numbers, as we begin diving a bit deeper into the, the relationship of Yahweh, the God of Israel, and his people, his chosen people. We can also glean. We can also learn so much from that relationship and how that relationship still impacts us today. So before we go any further into the book of Numbers, I will go ahead and read our passage for us one time through, and we will begin. So if you have your Bibles with you, please, Turn with me to the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers, and we will begin in chapter 11. 
book of Numbers, chapter 11, and it reads, Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And this is from the NIV. And when he heard them in his anger, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and fire died down. So that place was called Taborah, because fire from the Lord had burned among them. Verse 4, the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. The manna was like coriander seed and looked like resin. The people went around gathering it and then ground it into a hand mill or crushed it in a mortar. They cooked it in a pot or made it into cakes, and it tasted like something made of olive oil. When the dew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. Moses heard the people of every family wailing, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give birth to them? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land that you promised an oath to bear forefathers? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat, and I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you are going to treat me, put me to death right now. If I have found favor in your eyes, and do not let me face my own ruin. Then the Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting, that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there. I will, take, I will take of the spirit that is on you and put the spirit on them. They will help you carry the burden of the people so that you will not have to carry it alone. But Moses said, here I am among 600,000 men on foot, and you say I will give them meat to eat for a whole month? Will they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Will they have enough to eat if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? And the Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's arm too short? You will now see whether or not what I say will come true for you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you now. We surrender this time to you. Please, through your Holy Spirit, speak to us in all of our distractions today and even right now on our screens, Lord. Please, lead us back to yourself, God. We are here to receive your word together. We are here to be shaped and formed by you. May you please calm our hearts and our minds that we may be able to gladly receive and actively receive, God, to be able to wrestle, to be able to chew on your truth. That in all these things, Lord, we open up our hearts and our eyes to see, Lord, that your word, what you have done in the past, still is going on today. We surrender this time to you and all of our hearts and our minds unto you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in case you haven't noticed, as I was reading through some of the passage, there is already some vocabulary, some language, some images that have emerged that may be very uncomfortable. And as we go through the book of Numbers, you will come to find that there are many themes, many illustrations, many images that are very uncomfortable. One of those images being God being angry. or uh, God taking his, um, expressing the consequences of Israel's sin by taking the life of the Israelites, the very life of God's people. The God himself demands the justice for the sin that was done. Now, these are very uncomfortable themes, themes that we probably don't hear a lot about anymore when we preach the New Testament. However, these are the themes in the Old Testament that we are going to dive into, even though they may be very difficult. And of course, you know, 
in one sermon, it doesn't do justice to the whole reality of what happened in the Old Testament. And God took the life of his own people for their sins. But before we go any further, we must understand where we are in biblical history right now. We're in the book of Numbers. Now, of course, this comes right after Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. It comes after Israel is saved from Egypt by Yahweh through Moses. It comes after some of the laws governing their, their life, the way they form the communities. This comes after all of these events. This comes after God gives so many, so many instructions on how to how to correctly worship God in this context. And we see here that as we continue to move on through the book of Numbers, if you read earlier, the verse chapter 1 through 10, basically God gives further instructions on how Israel can truly be, how Israel can truly live and experience being God's people. And Leviticus and Numbers chapter 1 through 10 is basically about that, how Israel can continue to remain in rightful relationship with Yahweh, the God of Israel. And it is in all of this background, ladies and gentlemen, that we see that it is during this time, after Israel leaves Egypt, after God gives instructions, it is during this time that we see that all of these things culminate in one, into, into one aspect of Israel's existence. And that was the presence of God, meaning the, the, the proximity, the closeness, the living with, side by side with the one true God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this isn't just a story. This isn't something that was made up. But yes, ancient Israel did live with Yahweh. The one true living God at one point in human history. And this is a record of that. But we see here that even though God has given Israel so much promises, right? At this time, they're, they're trying to go to the promised land, Canaan. And after God establishes, this is who you are, my people. This is what my people does. This is what God's people does. So even after God gives all these instructions, and even after God shows his presence with Israel, being in the, the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, and in the tent of meeting, God's presence comes to this, this special, unique tent that only Moses can go to. And that's where God comes and talks to Moses. Even after all of these things were established, you would think, you would think that you know, Israel would be on their best behavior. You would think that Israel would be so focused on God after God has revealed himself over and over again. But ladies and gentlemen, just like us, no matter all of our experiences with God or lack of experience with God, so many times we too, we too can go on our own detours and walk away from the path of righteousness unto God. And in a sense, have this type of spiritual amnesia. We forget who God is. So it is here that we begin and it is here that we see that Israel starts to take that turn in light of all of the promises God has given them, in light of all the provisions God has given them, Israel starts to turn away from God, even though God has already done so much for them. And as we go through the book of Numbers, ladies and gentlemen, we must see that the book of Numbers is it's just a relationship. That's all it is. You know, a lot of the Old Testament is just stories about God's relationship with Israel. Plain and simple. And Book of Numbers will show us that. God's relationship with Israel and all of the events that happened in that relationship. So let us begin. Let us see how Israel, in light of the promises, turns away from God. Verse 1. Now the people complain about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when God heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So already, beginning off this chapter, we already see that there's something that's already happening here. That God is angry. Now, we need to be careful here. When it talks about God being angry, it's not like your anger or my anger. But it is the, the correct 
anger, the righteous anger. Anger because there is evil. Anger because there is injustice. This is the anger that only God can perfectly express. But what what has aroused God's anger? What did Israel do that would, would, would provoke God? What did Israel do? What happened in this relationship? And it is this. This is exactly what Israel did in this relationship. In verse 4, the rabble began to crave other food. And again, Israel started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. But we remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. We never see anything but this manna. This manna. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that you're, you're in this relationship with this person and you provided so much for them? And then one day they turn around and they say, everything that you've given me, I don't want it. Everything that you've given me up until this point, it's trash. Actually, I want to go back to a time where I didn't know you, where I never received your gifts. I want to go back to a time before I met you. This is what Israel is saying to God. Israel is saying, God, we don't even want to know you anymore. You know, the food that you provide for us, God, the manna, we don't even want that anymore. We want to go back. Back to a time where we didn't even know you, God. Back to a time where we could do whatever we want, or we thought we could do whatever we want. Ladies and gentlemen, if you remember this manna, this this food that God provided for Israel, it's not new in this chapter. It's actually pretty old. In Exodus chapter 16, it was the first time God gave food or manna to the Israelites as a sign and as an act of grace and mercy. But now we see here in Numbers 11 that Israel is saying, we don't want your grace. We don't want your mercy. We don't want your provision. We just want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to our slavery. We want to forget all about you, God. I, we don't care about your promises. We don't care about what you said. We don't care about any of these. We want to go back to slavery. And you see the delusion here. Even Israel themselves in this text says in verse 5, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Now that is a lie. It costed Israel their life. They were slaves in Egypt. And yet here, they're so deluded that they thought that eating in, eating in Egypt was free. Ladies and gentlemen, we look at ourselves today. Can you imagine how many times in your life, how many times in the life of the church, that we had these, these very subtle, very quiet, but still present, very quiet thoughts about, hey, what if I did go back? What if I just lived a life without God? What if I just, you know, did whatever I wanted? Does it even matter? Who cares? Regardless of everything I've experienced, regardless of everything that I know right now about God, what if I went back to do whatever I wanted to do? You see, ladies and gentlemen, it is, it is here that we see that no matter how many times no matter how many times God has said to Israel, I love you. This is my plan, my future plan for us, for you. And I will even give you the resources and the tools to do it, to accomplish it. And no matter how many times God says that to Israel, even here we see in the book of Numbers 11, Israel says, no, we don't want it. Ladies and gentlemen, we must ask ourselves today as well, how many times has God has already given us everything we needed? And the climax of that was his Christ, Jesus' son. God himself gave us his son, Jesus Christ. He gave us everything we needed to experience, to live into the promises 
for God's people. And yet, many times, just like Israel, we can say, no, I don't want it. I want to go back to a time before you, God, before I met you, before you gave me all this stuff. I want to go back to that time. So we already, right now, we already see the, the relationship, the, the dynamic of Israel and Yahweh. And to make matters even more intense, even more intense, this is what the leader of Israel, the prophet of God, Moses, this is how he responds to Israel's hard-heartedness, to Israel's blindness. This is what Moses says. Verse 10, Moses heard the people of every family wailing, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you, that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive these people? Did I give birth to them? Why do you tell me to carry these people in my arms as an earth carries an infant to the promised land? The very promise which you, God, promised to their forefathers. Where could I get meat to feed all these people? They keep wailing and saying, give us meat. I can't carry all these people by myself. Verse 15. If this is how you are going to treat me, God, then put me to death right now. If I found favor in your eyes, put me to death. And do not let me face my own ruin. That's not a very happy response. Moses doesn't respond to, to God in a positive way. If anything, Moses is saying, God, why me? If anything, Moses is saying, why do I need to deal with these people? And we need to remember, this is the same Moses, the same Moses who God used to split the Red Sea. This is the same Moses who God used to do all of the plagues, the miraculous plagues against the, the Pharaoh, the Egyptian king. This is the same Moses. And yet here he is. And this is the same Moses who got the Ten Commandments from the mountain. And yet here he is saying, why me, God? Why me? We see here that even not just the people of God are starting to doubt God and question God. Not even the leader, Moses. The leader is starting to doubt God and question God. People and the leader start to question God. And we see here that you can just imagine that, that this conversation, this conversation is, is, is a very sensitive conversation. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if you pay attention to what Moses is saying, he's essentially saying, I can't do it, God. I can't. I don't have the strength, the wisdom, the energy, the power. I can't do this, God. Moses is admitting and acknowledging and perhaps even overemphasizing his inadequacies. He's overemphasizing his weaknesses to God. Almost, in a way, like an excuse. Well, I can't do it, God, so don't give it to me. Give it to someone else. But you see, what we see here that you can just imagine that the kind of trust, the, the kind of relationship that it takes for Moses to even admit this. You see, just like you and, you and I, ladies and gentlemen, we wouldn't just go to a stranger when you start telling them, oh, I can't do this, I'm bad at this, you know, sometimes I fail at this, we don't just go to random strangers who we don't know, we don't trust, and we just start telling them all of our flaws, right? No, no one in their right mind would do that. So who would you tell your flaws and, and your questions and your concerns to? Who, would, who, who do you share this with? Only with those who you deeply trust. And we would only share our weaknesses 
our doubts with those we trust, meaning our relationship with that person is strong. So it is here that we see in this conversation with Moses and God that this relationship between Moses and God is strong because Moses can come before God and break down before God. And God, God will listen. God will hear him. And ladies and gentlemen, up until this point, we must really ask ourselves, the same question. When we pray to God, what is it like? If you pray to God, I hope you do. If you pray to God, when you pray to God, is it all just rainbows and, you know, get into a field of daisies? Pretending like everything's okay? Pretending like, you know, life is so great, I couldn't ask for anything better? Or when we come before God, do we actually tell Him our deepest Hurt, pain, struggle, questions, and doubts. Because it is here that Moses does that as well. And it is here that it shows us the, the true relationship that we all ought to have with God. So as Moses is in this environment, as Moses hears the people just constantly complaining, complaining, they want food, they want food, they want meat, they want to go back to Egypt, it makes sense that Moses would go to God and Moses would just say, God, just, just take it away, God, just stop, just make these people stop, God, I can't handle it anymore, I can't do this anymore, God, and, and, and his words, just kill me now. Who am I to carry these people? Just kill me now. And to that response, does God shame Moses? Does God say, oh, Moses, you just need more faith. Oh, Moses, you just need to try harder. Oh, Moses, stop complaining. It's not that bad. Is that what God says? Is that how God responds to Moses? What does God say to Moses? Does God ignore or dismiss or belittle Moses' genuine concern about the Israelites? What does God say? This is how God responds to Moses' concerns. Verse 16, the Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials. Have them come to the tent of meetings that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put the spirit on them. It will help you carry the burden of the people so that you will not have to carry it alone. In other words, God doesn't condemn Moses. God doesn't shame Moses for sharing his weakness, for sharing his doubts. God doesn't shame him. God doesn't tell him to try harder, have more faith. No, that's not what God says. But in this, in this true relationship, God answers him. And in God answering, in God saying he will provide 70 elders to help Moses carry the, the spiritual and the logistical burdens of these people. And God saying that, God is listening and God hears him. And God basically affirms that, yeah, Moses, that is a genuine concern. So let's address that. So that we can better lead and help these people, the Israelites. And to the, question of, of, to the question of the Israelites wanting food and rejecting God and wanting to go back to Egypt, this is what God says. And be prepared. This is not a uh, happy response. Verse 18, tell the people, consecrate yourself in preparation for tomorrow. When you will eat meat, the Lord heard you when you wailed. And when you said, if only we had meat to eat, we, be, we, we, we will be better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat, and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one, two, five, or ten or twenty days. No. You will eat meat for a whole month until it comes out of your nose and until you loathe it 
because you have rejected the Lord your God who is with you. You've rejected him and you wailed. You cried out to him. You complained, saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? Why did we ever leave Egypt? In other words, we see here that God says to, to the people of Israel, you rejected me. Even though I, God, was with you, I established all of these instructions. I established all of these structure of your society, the structure of your community. I established all of it, and yet you rejected me. I've given you so many promises. I've given you so many chances. Israel, yet you say no to me. You reject me. You cast me off to the side. And you still want to go back to your old ways. You still want to go back to Egypt. And God says, okay, have your way. I will provide you with meat to eat. But the outcome is not going to be what you expect. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this may sound a bit harsh to some of our ears as we live in a society that teaches us that uh, you know, love is not about correcting. Love is not discipline. But we live in a society that teaches us the opposite. That love is, hey, do whatever you want. That love is just con avoiding conflict. But we see here that God says, no, actually, Israel, you are in the wrong. Israel, you are in danger. For you have rejected God. And that rejection alone, that rejection alone is, is going to lead you to a path of death and suffering. Not because God is going to cause you to death or suffering, because life apart from God, life without God is death. Life without God is death and suffering. And that is what Israel has chosen. That is what Israel wants right now. You've rejected God. My brothers and sisters, we might not like wake up today and be like, I reject God. You know, raise your hand over the Bible. So I hear that I reject God. God be my witness. No, we may not do that explicitly. But have you ever wondered in what small ways in what small ways do we reject God? In what small ways do we reject God so much that eventually all of those small rejections of God eventually build up and become this monster? And before we know it, we totally reject God. And then we wonder, how did we get here? Have you ever wondered about the small ways that we start to reject God? Because I can guarantee you that at this point when Israel was like, I just want me. I want to go back to Egypt. I'm sure they weren't consciously thinking, I want to reject God. But you see, this, this just this simple, small act of wanting meat, of wanting to go, go back to Egypt, of whining to God. These simple acts, the small rejections of God, eventually will build up to a bigger beast. You cannot be slayed. We must look at ourselves as well, ladies and gentlemen, that we are just like the Israelites. So many times in our lives, so many times in our lives, we also have small rejections of God, small rebellions against God that eventually will totally lead us away from God. And we wake up one day and wonder, how did I get here? When we didn't even realize how insidious these rejections were, how they lurked in our lives. And so it is at this point in the story, after God says all of these things, that God will provide the meat, that God will help Moses and help him with providing 70 elders to help bear the spiritual burden of these people. And after all of these things, you would think that Moses would be happy. What does Moses say? So all of these things, Moses says, Verse 21, Moses said, here I am among 600,000 men on foot. Oh, that's not just counting the men. That's not including women and children. There's 600,000 men alone. So if you factor in their families, their wives, their kids, 
He built more than 600,000 people. So Moses said, here I am among 600,000 men, and you, God, you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. But God, would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? If you killed all of our animals and you gave them meat to eat, God, would they ever have enough to eat? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? It is at this instance that we continue to see Moses' displeasure. We continue to see Moses' doubt on God. And, and this frustration with Israel, it continues to grow in Moses. Even though God has already told Moses, hey, Moses, I will provide people to help you. Hey, Moses, I will provide the meat. Even though God says that, Moses still says, yeah, God, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Where are you going to get the meat? There's nothing. We're in the middle of, of nowhere. Where are you going to get the meat? You're going to kill all of our animals? If, even if you kill all of our animals, there's still not enough food for all our people. Where are you going to get the meat, God? You see, this mentioning of meat, of eating of food over and over again, it's not about the food, okay? It's not about the meat. It's not about what kind of meat you want, beef, pork, chicken. It's not about that. But this rejection of, of, the, the, of craving of meat, it shows a bigger problem. It is a rejection of God. Because God has already given them food to eat. It's not that Israel doesn't have food. Israel, ha they have food. It's that they don't want the food God gave them. They don't want the manna. They, want, they don't want God's provisions. They don't want God's resources. Israel wants to go back to their own resources. Israel wants to go back to someone else's resources. And in this case, food. And so we see here that it is a continual rejection of God. And yet God says, fine. We will continue this rejection cycle. I will provide the meat for you so that you can complete your rejection of me, of God. And it is here that Moses just still doubts that God, great, give them meat, but where are we going to get it? So we still here see that kind of an attitude in Moses' words here. Again, revealing the kind of relationship that Moses has with God. And at this point, what does God say? Verse 23, the Lord answered Moses, is the Lord's arm too short? You will now see whether or not what I say will come true for you all. And it is at this point that God finally directly addresses Moses' questions and concerns and doubts. God was, okay, fine, Moses. I've, I've talked already. I've, I've said these things. You still don't believe me? I'll just show you. Just be quiet and just watch. And I'll just show you. And so at this point, you can already kind of feel the, the stress. You can feel the, the tension between Moses and God and, and in the relationship. And of course, with God and Israel, you feel this like, you know, just this pull. The straining of the relationship. Because Israel wants to do their own thing. Moses wants to do his own thing, right? Moses is like, oh, just get rid of, just, you know, get rid of this burden from me, God. Israel is like, oh, God, we don't want to be here. We just want to go back. I can't even imagine what God is thinking, right? God has brought these people out, and he's just like, okay, I brought you guys out. Now you're here. Okay, these are some instructions. Just, you know, follow the instructions. And we can have a good, good relationship together. And then these people are like, no, God, we don't want to do that. We don't want the relationship. We don't want this. We don't want that. I can't imagine the frustration, the anger, the, the confusion that God must be in. Can you imagine God's like, I don't understand you people. I gave you everything. I gave you everything. I even gave you, like, all you needed to do was just, like, Use it. I gave you all the resources. You just needed to use the resources. You just needed to follow the instructions. I gave you everything. I basically handed it to you. And yet, here we are still saying no. That's still too hard. And we don't want to do it. We'd rather just go and do something else. Do our own thing. And ladies and gentlemen, again today, 
God has already given us everything we needed to do his will, to do his work. God has given us his complete word, scripture. God has given us one another, the church. We have everything we need. We have all the, all the people we need, all the resources, all the tools we need. We have everything. And yet the question is, why are we doing it? Are we acting like Israel now? Are we acting like Israel where, where we just want to go back to a time where it's just all about me? Where it's just, oh, forget about God. I just want to go back to a time where I can just focus on me, just do me, and that's it. But little do we know that in, in, in focusing on ourselves, we actually become slaves to ourselves. Israel is a slave to the Egyptians, but we would become slaves to ourselves and to this world. Or many times, are we like Moses? Are we like Moses? Where we're like, oh, I'm Moses. I'm super holy and spiritual and stuff. You know, these people called Israel, God, people, yeah, they're just weighing me down. So let's just cut them loose. Let's just get rid of them. They're just dead weight. Come on, God. Just get rid of the dead weight people. And so that it can just be me and you, God. You know, many times, ladies and gentlemen, in our Christian faith, and our Christian walk, we're just like the Israelites or Moses here. You know, many times like in, 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 in the church or in Christian gatherings, we you know, we bicker, right? We complain. We focus on the, the, not, the unimportant things. Oh, I want to do this. I want to do Why can't we do this as a church? Why can't we do that? Why can't we do this? Or many times we're just like Moses. Or we're like, oh, man, the church is bad. Christians, they're bad. You know, they just focus on, like, unimportant things. For me, I'm, I'm super spiritual. I'm holy. So, God, let's just, let's just be you and me, God. Just you and me, God. Forget about the church. Just you and me, God. You and me. That's it. See, ladies and gentlemen, with these kinds of attitudes, whether it's the attitude of the Israelites or the attitude of Moses, even when God answers us, just like he did to the Israelites, even when God provides, even then, we still question, just like what Moses said, but oh, come on, God, where are you going to get to me? You see, ladies and gentlemen, many times in our lives, we are Israel. We are Moses' attitude problem. And this, in this point in time, but we need to look at ourselves and ask ourselves. It's not that, like God said right here in verse 25, is the Lord's arm too short? Meaning, is God unable to do it? Meaning, is God incapable? Does God not have the power to do it? You know, many times the question is, the question is not, can God do it? Many times the question is, are you willing? We see here that the Israelites were not willing. Moses was not willing. God can do it. And many times we are not willing. We're not willing to follow the instructions. We're not willing to take all the resources and the tools that God has given us and to use it for God's glory. We're not willing. And then when nothing happens in our lives, we're in the church. In the world, we blame God. We're like, oh, see, God, I knew it. You don't answer prayers. See, God, I knew you weren't there. But in actuality, it was our fault. We didn't take responsibility for our own action or inaction. Just like the Israelites and Moses here. And at the end of all of these things, at the end of it all, what happens? God says he will show Moses. What does he show Moses? He, this is what he shows Moses. Verse 31. Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail in from the sea. It brought them down all around the camp to about three feet above the ground, as far as the day's walk in any direction. All that day and night and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than ten homers. Then they spread them out all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people. And God struck them with a severe plague. Therefore, the place was called Chibrath Hatabach, because there they buried the people who had craved other food. In other words, God provides for Israel. He gives them the meat they asked for, but they died eating it. In other words, God, you know, God kills some of the Israelites. So in a way, he did answer Moses too, right? 
God left in Moses' burden because there's less people. But you see, the way that God answered Israel, the way that God answered Moses, it wasn't a good answer. It was more of an answer of discipline, an answer of, of consequence. It wasn't an answer of blessing. It wasn't an answer of construction. It was an answer of destruction. The way God answers Moses, the way God answers the Israelites in this account. It was very disarming. And it is at this point that we see that how can God kill his own people? Right? How can God give this meat to his people to eat and they die from it? Now, this isn't to justify God's actions, but, or this isn't to justify the killing of the Israelites. But, as I said earlier, do we ever consider that life without a relationship with God is also death? Because if that's true, then weren't these Israelites basically asking for that? Didn't God just simply complete what the Israelites asked for? The Israelites wanted to reject God, wanted a life without God. And God said, okay, you want a life without me? Go ahead. Complete the circle. This is life without me. Life without God is just death. And that's exactly what happened to the Israelites. They got what they, got what they asked for, a life without God. Death. That's what they got. So we see here that God wasn't playing games. God wasn't trying to manipulate these people. God was just giving them what they asked for. And ladies and gentlemen, for us today, I know this is a more somber story, and a lot of the stories and numbers are going to be somber. But that somberness is good. So I truly hope and pray that it will wake us up during these pandemic times. It will wake us up during all of this confusion, and even in our own relationship with God and in the church, it will wake us up. You see, ladies and gentlemen, many times we are Israel. Many times we are Moses. And if we don't realize that, it just proves the point. But so many times we don't realize it because we're so immersed, so entrenched in that mess. We're so surrounded by that rebellion, by that sin, that we don't even realize what we're doing until it's too late. Today, you need to ask yourself, are you acting like the Israelites who just want to do their own thing and just, and, you know, basically have less and less relationship with God and just do whatever they want, which eventually leads to death? Or are you like Moses, who is like, oh, forget these people. Forget these people called Christians. Forget these people called the church. I would just rather do my own thing. It's easier. So God, just cut me loose. Cut my ties with the Christians. Cut my ties with the church. So they can just be you and me, God. Just you and me. Me and Jesus. That's it. Me and Jesus against the world. Who are we today? Because we see that either option didn't turn out well for the, for the Israelites. Nor for Moses, for that matter. So for us today, ladies and gentlemen, really ask yourself this question. More importantly, go before God today and ask God through the Holy Spirit to show your heart. How are we rejecting God today, little by little or in big things as well? How are we reject, rejecting him? And, and lastly, how are we also neglecting? How are we also ignoring? That God has already given us all the promises, all the tools and resources, and yet many times we still fail to obey him. It's not because God didn't give us what we need to do his will. It's because we don't want to do it. Because we want something else. So ladies and gentlemen, really ask yourself these questions today because these are not easy questions to ask. These are heavy, heavy questions. And wherever you are right now, I don't know, but wherever you are right now, I would encourage you to take some time today to do just that. Ask God to just dissect your heart and your goals, your ambitions, everything in your life, and in relationship to other believers in the church.
Let us not end up like the Israelites here. Let us not end up like Moses here with attitude problems. Let us actually continue, continue to receive the grace and mercy through Christ. Let us continue to use all of that great gift and privilege and skills and resources that God has given us through Christ and his Holy Spirit. Let's use all of that to become, truly be his people on earth, to truly love each other, to truly serve each other, to truly be holy, to truly be unique and set apart from this world. But before we can do that, we got to answer the question first. Who are you today? One of the Israelites? Or Moses? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, God, and uh, there's so many things that we don't realize about ourselves, don't realize about the world, about the church. We don't realize many things. Though. But it is during this time that we ask that you please open our eyes, open our hearts, to truly see the defects in our hearts, in our, in our habits, in our minds, God to see the flaws in us, the sin, so we can truly surrender to you. Lord, we ask you, please forgive us. Forgive us for being like the Israelites, for rebelling against you in small and big ways, for being like the Israelites and wanting to just live a life without you. We ask you to forgive us many times for being like Moses, for just wanting to just get rid of ourselves of these burdens, of, of, of this group of people, of this community, Lord. Because it's too hard. It's too frustrating. But we ask that in all of these things, continue to refine us, purify us as your church, as your people, living in pandemic days today, God. And may we emerge out of this pandemic, sanctified by you. May we emerge out of this pandemic with more passion for you, God, and for one another. Lord, today we ask you, please, uh, Really just uh, do, do some heart surgery on us today, God. We don't know what is on our hearts, Lord. Only you do. Please convict us through your Holy Spirit. Break us down and convict us. Show us and bring us to the end of ourselves. Teach us to not depend on ourselves anymore or to depend on this world anymore. To depend on you. Live this life together, God. It takes two people to have a relationship, not just one. May you please, please lead us to your Holy Spirit, Lord. It is in all of these things, God, we surrender at your feet. We trust, Lord, as we continue to go through the book of Numbers, as we continue to read all the experiences of Israel and, and of your relationship, God, with Israel, as we read these experiences, we trust you continue to sanctify and edify us as your church together, that we may truly learn from Israel's mistakes, that we may truly better know who you are, God and we may truly surrender and live and obey you today. And all these things we surrender to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.